Well, welcome everybody. It is my pleasure to be here today with Corey Jensen and Megan Farner of Latter Day Disciples, which is how her name is showing on the meeting right now. <laughs> so, uh, I am just uh, grateful to have both of you here. I think some people that are watching this might be aware of your background. I'm not going to go into great depth on that, but Corey is an author of at least three books on the temple. I'm not sure if you've authored other books, Corey, have you? Nope. <laughs> okay. Three-time author, all about the temple. Um, preparing for, understanding, and completing your endowment, if I remember the, the three correctly. Um, I've listened to the second and third. Uh, I figured, like you uh, kind of indicated, if you've been through the temple, you probably don't need the first one, but it's uh, prep for it. And really love those uh, books and own them as well. And have read parts, again, of the, the third one on completing your endowment. So very, very detailed, uh, amazing books, really, for me as I went through those. Um, so I appreciate you writing those. And and Megan Farner, uh, not to be outdone, has, has just passed the 100 podcast mark with her um, podcast, Latter-day Disciples, which is an awesome podcast everybody should listen to. Um, I know you've you've actually had quite a few guests for your podcast that have been on talking about the temple. I don't know if that was like a conscious thing, like you're going to go out and find people um, that have a certain insight into the temple. But um, how, of that hundred, how many would you say are temple specific? Oh, man. You know, it's really interesting because we very rarely search for guests more often than not, our guests come to us. And so we get to see these beautiful themes kind of unravel throughout the year of these topics that are repeated. Uh, I think you're right. I think the temple was one, um, even going back to a little over a year ago when we first interviewed Corey on the podcast. Um, I'm not sure exactly how many, but I, I think it's it's got to be may, maybe five to 10 this year alone that have been themed on the temple. And then we also had a full two-day conference that was totally dedicated to understanding the doctrine of the temple. So it's it's been a theme, I think, that the Lord has really wanted us to emphasize this year. And that's why he's brought the people that he has um, to be our guests. And I apologize for my voice. I sound like I'm really sick. I'm not, but I can't talk today. So sorry about that. <laughs> That's all right. That just makes it so that you can sing on a lower octave at church. <laughs> if I can sing at all. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's the best part for me about recovering from a cold is like, I actually have a deep voice I can sing with. So <laughs> Otherwise it's not very good. So anyway, well, thank you both for being on. Um, I want to start off with a few questions here to kind of get a little bit better understanding for, and share with people, uh, the, the process of an author. So Corey, I'll direct these first few questions to you. And then we're going to get to the course that you've both put together. And I'll ask Megan a few questions there. So Corey, I wanted to start off with like, just for background, when did your sort of serious level of interest in the temple first begin? Was there something that triggered you that you said, okay, I'm going to really dive into this topic because I can, I mean, like as members of the church, I think we mostly know that like the temple is important, but you've gone to like a whole nother step of really trying to understand, which very few people I think, including myself have, have done. And so I'm always appreciative when somebody can say, here's the work I've laid it out now enjoy this and go deeper. And so um, just share a little bit about like your own process of how you decided to go really deep in trying to understand the temple? Well, great question. And uh, first of all, I, I want to thank you for this opportunity um, to meet with you today It's and, and everyone on here. Um, I Hopefully some, some of the things we share will be a benefit or uh, helpful. I was, I went through the temple the first time um, in August of 1985 uh, before my um, before going on my mission. And back then, 
there wasn't any temple preparation. There wasn't really any kind of preparation at all. I had no idea what to expect. I walked in completely cold. I left two hours later and I can, um, <clears throat> up to that point in my life, you know, at, at 19 years old, um, as I left that day, I I'd felt the spirit to maybe a greater degree than I ever had before. Um, so I knew that this was something significant and important, but I had, it was nothing like what I expected, which I didn't know what to expect, but it was not what I expected. And I really didn't, it didn't make any sense. I mean, I left kind of with my head swimming, like, whoa, what was that all about? <laughs> what just happened? Um, and so, you know, shortly after that, I went on my mission when I got back home, I decided I really wanted to understand the temple better. Um, I knew that it was important. I started attending weekly and I started just reading everything I could find, um, which honestly wasn't a whole lot. But I I continued to, you know, really make the temple a subject of study over um, the next 20, 30 years and um, read everything I could on it. And I found kind of two things. Um, at, at that point in time, it's gotten better since. There's been some good good things published on the temple in the last, thankfully, in the last 10 years. But prior to that, everything was either kind of so general and so vanilla that it wasn't super helpful. Or it was so scholarly and esoteric that most of the church was never going to read it. Um, and you had to put, you know, it's like, okay, the ancient Sumerians danced around on the ziggurat doing blah, blah, blah. And it's like, okay, wait, who cares? What do I have to do with anything, you know, today? Um, you know, Hugh Nibley stuff. He, I mean, he has some fantastic things, but it's, it's kind of deep. And so when my daughter got ready to um, receive her endowment, um, my oldest daughter, I I really wanted her to have a better experience than I did. And I had by that time come to the conclusion that the scriptures were really the best book about the temple. And um, so I sat down and put together a whole bunch of scriptures and we went through those for six or eight weeks. We sat down on Sunday evenings for like an hour um, and we went through all these scriptures and, and to kind of prepare her for her temple experience and just to help her have some context and some background to understand, you know, uh, what was going to happen. And when she came out of the temple for the first time, she was like, wow, dad, that was so amazing. And I understood and it made sense to me why we did this and this and this. And I could see, you know, like the light went on and um, all the things you were talking about. And she was really excited about. Uh, her experience. So that, anyway, if that answers your question. Yeah. I, I had kind of a similar experience, no prep. I'm, uh, I, I went through the first time in, uh, 88. So just a few years after you walked in and, you know, walked into the dressing room and I was like, you know, looking around and, uh, you know, right then I was like, Hmm, I don't know anything uh, about what's about to happen. So, um, yeah, it was a, a totally cold, not a cold experience. It like uh, went into it cold, not knowing, um, having any real prep for it. So um, that's, kind of everyone, that's kind of everyone's story, right? Like other oh, than Corey's God. daughter, God bless you for that. But like, the, I think that's ever, like I went, I wasn't, I'm a baby. I was only in doubt in 2013. So always after you guys, lots of changes later, right? Um, but I think I had kind of, uh, I, I think it was mostly a positive experience because I was determined to be positive. Um, but I had a lot of opposition leading up to it too. And so I think that that's, um, that's really relatable. And I think that's one of the things that we want to help alleviate is that there is, um, such mystery around the temple that when you engage in it for the first time, it feels completely foreign and it can be faith shattering for people. I went to an endowment 
um, session just a couple months ago. And there was a young woman who was receiving her endowment for the first time. And you could tell she was not having a good experience. And so I think that coming from this and recognizing that there's kind of this need in the church for there to be more information so that when people approach the temple, they have that that kind of experience. Um, I think that's something that Corey and I have really tried to speak to through the class. Sorry, I totally yeah. just but there you go. <laughs> cool. No, that's great. And I, I think that's probably true. I mean, the, the church does do at least some, you know, temple prep classes now for people that are going through and, um, and that's great. I mean, any kind of background that you get is, is obviously better than not. <laughs> so, um, that's great. So Corey, uh, in terms of like the three books that you wrote, I'm curious, like how many years, like when you got started digging into this, what was your process and how, how many years did it take for you to like research? Because like just your last, the third book, Completing Your Endowment has 264 endnotes. So like how did, what was your research process like to, to go into this and how long did it take you? Um, <clears throat> well, like I said, I, it's, been 30 years um really and it's um you know it, it's sometimes been more diligent than others and more focused than others but i have really read everything everything i could find uh about the temple or um and even some of it came from other sources it was interesting but as i tried to put that effort in uh the lord would bring things to my attention and and I finally got to where I felt like, okay, I'm starting to really kind of understand this and what's going on. Um, but it took a long, long time and it took a lot of work and a lot of effort. And I don't know if there was anything systematic. It was just trying to be diligent in, and it was a topic I was interested in. So um, a lot of it came just from questions and trying to answer questions. And as things came up, I would dig into, oh, I've never heard of masonry. Well, and, that, and somebody's saying that's where the endowment came from. Well, what's that all about? So just kind of, you know, a step at a time um, going through and and really reading everything that I could find on the topic. And so, then really about it as well. And then what? Sorry. Sorry, really praying about it as well. Hmm. So of the the content in, in your books, particularly like the third one, Completing Your Endowment, is, is that... I mean, like what percentage of that would you say is like original thought sort of versus like you just read so much and you just kind of distilled it and organized it and and brought it together um, kind of from all these other sources? I think that's really true of all three books. It's it's more than my own original thought or I mean, I've had the Lord has opened my eyes in several places and I've had revelation on the temple as well as part of that process. But really in the books, it was a lot of just compiling um, and organizing things and putting it together in a way that made sense. And that um, um, I, hopefully has been helpful to others in kind of coming to understand. I think one of the mistakes and I made this for a while too. I think sometimes in the church we have this attitude that, okay, I go to the temple and I and I and I accept this these ordinances on faith and I walk through this over and over again. And 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 I'm a little bit like Adam, right? I'm gonna go and I'm gonna do these sacrifices because the Lord's asked it of me, and I don't really understand what I'm doing, but I'm just going through the motions in faith. And someday in the next life I will understand what all this means. And I felt that for a while, but as I, as I really start, as the endowment started to open up, as it started to unfold, it really, um, there, there were a couple of things that were kind of paradigm shifts for me. One of them was, and it took me, I'm a slow student, right? That's why it took 30 years. Megan learned all this in about 18 months, but it took me a long time. Okay. And, you know, just the realization one day as it dawned on me, oh, wait a minute, this endowment, it's not about history. 
It's our story. It's Adam and Eve are archetypes. They're symbols for each of us. This isn't just telling us a history, you know, because I wondered that. Why Why do we have to review this story of the Garden of Eden over and over and over and over and over again? And, and it, it took a long time for the light bulb to go on. But then that changed everything. And um, same with, oh, I had another thought and I just lost it. Um, anyway, there were these things that, that really helped open this up. Oh, another one was uh, just realizing, wait a minute, there's no mention of death and the afterlife in this endowment. The veil is not, I just kind of made that assumption. And that was a huge change, a shift as well. And then the idea that we progress through a celestial, a terrestrial, and a celestial state. Um, th there was all these things that started to shift around, and I thought, okay, I've got to start to relook at this. And it really came to me very strongly that, um, you know, the endowment was given to us in this life. It's meant to help us in this life. And I believe it's really, the Lord really intends us to um, to comprehend it and to understand it in this life. I, I, I think if we have the attitude of, oh, I'll just go and I feel the peace and feel the spirit and I just go through the motions and then someday in the next life, somebody will all explain it to me. I think that's a real mistake. But at the same time, we're all a little bit like, you know, in Acts, the story of um, of the eunuch who's riding along in his carriage and and um, as it Philip comes up Philip. to him and says, hey, what are you reading? And he's like, well, I'm reading Isaiah. And he's like, oh, oh, OK, well, do you understand what you're reading? No, I mean, this is Isaiah. How, how am I going to understand this without some help? And the temple's a little bit the same way. We're, we're thrown into this very symbolic, very rich, very beautiful environment, but with zero preparation, with no help, with no, I mean, it's like being dropped off in China without a dictionary or a thesaurus or anything to help you. You know, it's just, okay, we'll go figure out how to read Chinese. Well, all right, that's, that's, <laughs> You know, that's kind of a daunting challenge. And so the temple's a little bit the same way. And so um, I, I was I was asked by the Lord very directly to write the, the first book, and I did. Um, and, uh, I, and I've shared this um, before, but I, I'll share it again here. I, I tried to be very careful and prayerful about what, I mean, it was a sacred topic. It's sacred to me. I wanted to approach it very carefully. I tried to be very prayerful about, and I felt guided and directed and led through the process. And I, you know, I, I'm nobody, right? Nobody needs to listen to me. Nobody has to agree with me. I'm not an authority. You know, you can read what I write and 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 read what, or, and I hope you'll participate in this temple course and take whatever's helpful away from you. And if there's something that's not, then discard it. But in the books, I tried to be very careful and prayerful. And I know Megan and I, in developing this temple class online course, again, tried to be very prayerful about it. Um, and at one point, I had a real question on a particular topic about, should I include this? Should I not include it? Is this something I should talk about? Is it better left alone? And I went to the temple um, with that question in mind went through a session, was sitting in the celestial room afterwards and pondering that question. And I asked the Lord again, okay, do you want me to include this or should I leave it out? And I was just looking for a simple yes or no answer. But um, the word of the Lord came to me that day and what he said, I can quote it exactly. He said, I would not have my sons and daughters in ignorance any longer. And that really stuck with me. And I, and I, thought about it a lot. I've thought about it a lot since then. Um, I, I took it as a yes, and whatever the topic was, it, it's in the books, and it's in the course. But um, I've thought about it a lot since then, and I believe the world we live in nowadays, and the, you know, as we get closer to the second coming, and all of these things that are happening, I think there's a need, uh, a greater need for us now to really understand, to have our life build on the temple. We need to be grounded in the temple, grounded in the Book of Mormon and some of these core things, or we just won't, we won't succeed and we won't survive. Um, 
it's not enough. Maybe it was okay for our grandparents to say, well, I'll get it someday in the next life. But I really think the Lord wants us to understand and come to appreciate what he's left for us in the endowment. And it's very, very beautiful. And we all need some help to get started because it, or, or it'll take you 30 years unless you're smarter, faster than I am. And so that's what we've tried to very carefully put together in this course is, and, and this this course is really intended for people who have been endowed, who have been going to the temple long enough that you're very familiar with the ceremony. And that as we go, as we go through the material, as we talk about things, I, I think, I hope the light bulbs will go on and you'll be able to make connections and it will enrich and, and bless your temple experience. Um, you know, the difference between a, a routine and a ritual the routine might be something we get up and we do every day. You know, I get up in the morning, I get dressed, I brush my teeth, I eat breakfast. I, I mean, you don't have to give any thought to that. It's just routine. And and sometimes I think we, sometimes things that are sacred, you know, the sacrament, the temple can be a, become a little bit routine to us. But um, as opposed to a ritual, that's something we very deliberately it, it may be repetitive, but it's something we very deliberately and conscientiously participate in, and it has great meaning to us. And I and those temple rituals and the sacrament and those things, the more we understand them, then I think the greater significance they have in our lives. Yeah, that's so, good. Sorry, right, long answer to a short question. Good answer. Good answer. Um, what? Let me just ask this though. In terms, uh, I'll leave the. Uh, the the authorship stuff alone here after this question but um what what kind of tools did you use to organize all of these different ideas and concepts i mean were you just like in a massive word doc or did you have several <laughs> word docs going how did you keep track of all that stuff oh gosh you'll laugh um if i'm honest <laughs> three by five cards uh <laughs> No, no, it really was, it, if, if I'm really, really honest, I, I didn't even really have an outline. I just kind of sat down as I was led by the spirit. It just came out. <laughs> I mean, I knew the, knew the materials, knew where to put it. The, um, some of it I had organized uh, a little bit. I mean, I, you know, yeah, it was just, it, it really, a lot of it just came to me. How it was to be organized so hmm. it I, I wish i could say it was more uh well thought out and organized and that i had this nice outline and did all the things that you typically do but i didn't i in fact i did it so backwards i wrote the first chapter i sent a couple of query letters in um one to desert book and one to cedar fort and it takes about six months to get an answer back. So I had the first chapter written. I sent my query letter. I sent the first chapter. And um, and then over the next six months, while I waited for an answer, I wrote the book. <laughs> and so when the answer came back, yeah, we'd like to publish it. It was ready to go. But, um, well, it should have been written before I sent it. Anyway, my process was, was really kind of haphazard. But hmm. Well... If you can uh, write a book by the Spirit's guidance, that's uh, not a bad way to go. So <laughs> if I, I was just kind of curious, like how you kept track of all the the notes and things that you were going to put in. Did you just feel it just kind of come like, uh, you know, like, oh, there's this thing on, you know, the scepter and the orb and, uh, you know, just kind of curious how that all flowed together. I mean, I, I had kept files and I had read uh, a lot of materials and and I had scriptures and things. So I had some files that I where I had stuff or, that I could go pull from and, and put it together. But I really didn't have it organized in exactly that way before the books. It just, the books was the organization of all the material. Oh, that makes sense too. Okay. All right. So let's move on to a temple question. And then I want to get to Megan and talk a little bit about the course. So should have had um, something really cool, like I should have had something really cool, like scripture notes or something, but I didn't. <laughs> but it definitely, definitely would have helped, but uh, <clears throat> I'm sure, um, or a good file cabinet. Um, so, 
in your books as well, the, especially the third one, um, where you talk about the signs and tokens and just kind of what they represent. Um, the first token representing the light of Christ. And then, you know, as you progress on, I think for most people that don't really have a grasp on the that symbolism, we don't progress. Like, like it's like to progress, I think there's people that progress without maybe seeing the symbolism and stuff just because they're living right. They're they're seeking revelation themselves. They're going through the journey. They're on the path. Right. And maybe they aren't putting it all together with the symbolism from the temple. So I think that's like one group of people. And then there's another group. It's like maybe the, the bulk of us <laughs> that that we're trying our best, but we need some some signs and pointers. And the temple is like, okay, this is where you're going first. Focus on this, master this, and then you can move on to this next step. And so, and I don't know if that makes sense the way I described it, but uh, in terms of like mastering that first step of the light of Christ, how does how does somebody get to the point where they're like, okay, Heavenly Father, like, uh, how do I master this step? Like, what? What does that look like when when somebody has mastered that first sign and then they can move on to the next? Because there is a process where you, you go from one to the next. Yeah, there definitely is, and I and that process is probably a little different for um, different people. I and I so let me back you up just a little bit um, for those who may not be familiar with what Oak, if you haven't been through the materials and if you're not familiar with what Oak is asking, um, one of the things that we cover in the temple class and in the, and in the book is one possible interpretation for the tokens that we receive the, um, in conjunction with the covenants that we make. And I, I want to say, Two things before, well, one thing before we start. Anytime the Lord uses symbols, one of the big mistakes I made for many years in approaching the temple was I, I was too small in my thinking. And I, I wanted, in my little brain, I wanted, you know, X symbol to equal Y thing. And I was always looking for, oh, okay, I've got this cool symbol here, X. What is the Y? What does it mean? And um, it was really in the scriptures that, and and looking at some books on symbolism, that I the light kind of went on, and I finally realized, oh, you know what, the Lord can use symbols in a whole lot of ways. Just one one quick example: you look at Lehi's dream. Very simple symbols there: a tree, a rod, a path. You know, we're all familiar with it. And, and Lehi, he comes back from his experience and he relates it to his family. And he, and he relates it to Laman and Lemuel, here's your condition. And Nephi and Sam, I mean, this is, I mean, it's very, very individualized and personalized to his family. Nephi goes and he um, wants to see the same vision. And he's, and he's blessed with that. And he testifies later that I saw the, the things that my father beheld. He sees the exact same things, the exact same symbols. But as the angel explains those symbols to him, he's shown, you know, the, the uh, Mary, um, Christ, his mortality. He's shown, you know, the history of the world down right until the winding up scenes. And it's all tied in those same symbols. And so here you have a very broad application and a very um, narrow application. And so when we talk about symbols in the temple, I always want to add the the little um, caveat or the asterisk that hey, hey, this is one this is one way to view these. Don't don't limit don't don't think that okay this is the only way or if you understand something a little different it doesn't mean you're wrong and I'm right or I'm wrong and you're right. The Lord can use these in a lot of different ways, which is really beautiful. Now the the way that we outlined in the course and the way in the book is is one 
um, interpretation of those tokens that I think is very helpful because it outlines some gifts and some experiences that we can expect on the path on our journey back. And if we go to the temple with that with that framework in mind and with that understanding in mind, and if you'll ask the Lord, where am I at? If you have a question, you know, have I had the baptism of fire and the Holy Ghost? Have I had that experience or not? Is that a process? Is that an event? Where am I at in this? And if you'll go and you'll ask the Lord, you can he can you can get to the point in the ceremony and he can say, okay, you're here. And then you can understand, all right, this is what I've received. This is what I, this is where I'm at. And then the follow-up question is, okay, what do I lack? What do I need to do to progress further? In my own life, so, to, so now to answer your question a little more directly, how do I progress from kind of one stage to the next? I don't know specifically for you what was helpful to me, what was most helpful to me is I made it a practice for many, many years of going to the Lord and saying, okay, what is the next step for me? What what would you have me do? I know there's a whole big long list, but just give me one thing. And the Lord would answer that. And I would, he would tell me something and I would go work on that. And sometimes it was just a day or two. Sometimes it was many months before I felt like that was completed. But then I could come back and return and report again in my prayers, okay, this is what I, I've done this. This is what I learned. And inevitably there was always something that I needed to learn through that process. And then I'd ask, okay, what's the next step? And and I'd be given the next one. And that process together with, um, with another thing I started about the same time, I began keeping a separate um, spiritual journal. And it's just a Word document that I have on my computer. It's not meant for anybody to ever read. But I started recording questions I had, insights, spiritual insights, experiences, just just my spiritual journey and things I was struggling with. It was just kind of raw um, on the spot. And and I also recorded these, you know, this, this kind of, uh, experience I was having with the Lord. What do I do next? And then reporting and, and what I learned. And that became, and I, and I did that process for many, many years. And those two things, uh, number one, they really, really helped me draw closer to the Lord and really helped me to understand and get better at receiving revelation. Number two, the the things the Lord led me through really taught me and helped me gain some things that I did lack. And then number three, the the journaling aspect was tremendously helpful to um, preserve insights, preserve things that I'd learned, but also for me to go back through periodically and read and review and go, okay, you know what? This is something I struggle. I struggle with this doubt or I struggle with this question and it pops up over and over and over. This is something I really need to, you know, figure out or fix or get behind me. Um, so I don't know if those would be helpful to you, but that would be my suggestion. If you're a wondering, where am I at on this whole path? And then B, how do I progress along with it? Um, that's, what's been helpful for me. Yeah, that's great. That's very helpful. So I know, um, Megan is going to, uh, unmute here. Megan, are you, are you, uh, able to do that? Yep. I'm here. Okay, cool. So, um, let me shift over to the course. Now you and Corey have put this course together. Why don't you talk a little about how that idea formulated and came about? Yeah, absolutely. So Corey and I met a little over a year ago, year and a half ago, maybe through a mutual friend. Um, I had invited Corey on the podcast. And so he and I did an episode together and it was just one episode and it it, it was great. Like for me, um, it was at a time when the Lord was really starting to teach me these things about the temple. And so I, I found it very beneficial. We did that episode together and then um, that was kind of it. We didn't really talk for a while. Um, we emailed back and forth a few times, but in the meantime, I had been introduced to some platforms and I had been taking some virtual courses online myself. 
And I really loved the format of them. They, you know, there's a whole industry behind these different platforms now that I think has really emerged since COVID and since learning needed to be done virtually more uh, and that there needed to be a platform and a format that made it really accessible and easy to follow and also impactful. And I just loved it. I love taking these classes myself and I had felt impressed from the Lord that this was something that I wanted to do with our podcast platform that we wanted to offer another way for people to um, learn and digest content uh, in addition to the podcasts and the conferences that we do. So fast forward a few months, we held our first virtual conference in April and Corey participated in that. uh, And that was really wonderful. We talked a lot of temple themes, although that wasn't the overarching theme of that conference. And then in the summer, we started thinking about doing another conference in the fall. And the Lord revealed to me that it needed to be on the temple, particularly. And at the same time, Corey and I had reconnected. And it's it's almost like the Lord just kind of connected these dots for me, where you think that you're working on separate projects. And then the Lord shows you like, oh, these are actually all the same thing. <laughs> um, and so in connection with our fall conference that we knew we were going to do it on the temple, I felt impressed to reach out to Corey and ask if he was interested in, in being the instructor for this online course and using a lot of the content from his books to, to build out this virtual class. And Corey was really open to it. I think it's something that neither he nor I recognized a me. Well, I'll just speak for myself. When I presented it to Corey, it wasn't something that I recognized there was actually a great need for, if that makes sense. Like I, I literally was just going off of like, Hey, the Lord gave me this thought. What do you think about it? And once I stopped, like started talking to Corey about it and presenting the idea to him, I think it became more clear to both of us that this is something that actually there is a great need for in the church, um, that there is a need for supplemental material for people that are going to the temple. Hi, my buddy's going to talk to you apparently. (laughs) Um, but that there, that there was, um, an open window an opportunity to really present information to a large number of people. And that felt like a confirmation to us that, that it was inspired because we know that the Lord, whoa, what are you doing? (laughs) Oh my gosh. Sorry. Um, when the Lord does his work of salvation, he doesn't just save one person. He wants to save as many people as possible. And so the fact that we felt invited to do this and to share it with people, um, it, it just, it really, um, it felt inspired is what it came down to. So can you give a little bit of an overview of the course? Like what do you, what do you cover? How long does it take to do the course? That kind of stuff. Yeah, absolutely. So our class is six hours of video and audio content. We include transcripts. If it's easier for people to read, we have subtitles. We also have podcast episodes. If you just want to listen to it and don't have time to watch the video, Uh, we tried to make it as accessible as possible in that way. And we cover a variety of topics from the very beginning Um, we talk about a couple of paradigm shifts that perhaps it would be helpful for us all to adopt as we approach the temple and trying to understand the doctrine of the temple and the message of the temple. The name of the class is called House of Learning, Understanding the Doctrine of the Temple. And that was really purposeful when Corey and I named the class uh, that we wanted to emphasize in Doctrine and Covenants when the Lord says, this is a house of learning. And what is the thing that the Lord wants us to be learning in the temple. Obviously we all can go to the temple and receive revelation of a thousand kinds. And that's all very valid. And I think that that is a purpose of the temple, but we also think that the temple has a particular overarching message that we are each supposed to be understanding. Um, And so that is a lot of the basis for the content we go over. We talk about 
symbolism, again, from the perspective that Corey shared, that there is more than one interpretation to every symbol. Uh, In fact, that is one of the beautiful things about truth. And one of the ways you can establish truth is that something that is true works on every level. And you can see this even in the sciences. Um, A lot of studies about quantum physics and the God particle and seeing that And you can look at it on the cellular level and you can look at it on a cosmic scale and it's all the same. Uh, So that's kind of the approach that we try to take to talking about the temple symbolism. We talk about the ordinances, what composes an ordinance, what is the purpose of an ordinance? And that hits on some of the things Corey was talking about, that there are physical components, there are laws, there are particular teachings associated with the ordinance, and then there's a spiritual component and you need all of those things before you have a completed covenant or uh, yeah, a completed covenant and a completed ordinance. We talk about covenants. We go into covenant ceremonies anciently, what those were, some of the symbolisms of my gosh, he's so talkative. He never talks this much. I'm sorry. I hope you guys can hear me. Okay. You're being so loud. He he just wants to be a participant. I know. I know. Destined to be a future podcaster. I know he's going to love the spot. Getting started. I know he's got the face for video. Um, anyway, so we do talk about covenants, uh, trying to emphasize the importance of them, how uh, ancient patterns can teach us about our modern covenants. We do talk about the five modern temple covenants and try to give some expanded perspective on what those actually are. And that's something actually that I would add to the question that you asked Eric, about how do you move in this progression through the temple? And I would say that our covenants are progressive they are meant to build on each other. And so if you feel like you're in a particular area, learn the covenant that is associated with it and then go back to the drawing board and say, do I really understand what this covenant is? Do I really understand what the law of obedience and the law of sacrifice is entailing? Um, Because I think it's really easy for us to assume that we know all our covenants and we're keeping all our covenants. But if we're not seeing that progression spiritually, then there's more opportunity for us to, to learn there. Um, let's see. We talk about the temple's testimony of Jesus Christ. We even include some historical information about some of the things that were previously included in the temple that aren't included currently, but that have some really beautiful significance as we understand more about Jesus Christ and why he is the Messiah, why he did a work that none of us could do for ourselves and how the testimony testifies or how the temple testifies of Jesus Christ. And then the capstone of the course, and and this is really the big takeaway um, that we hope people understand, is the idea of becoming a temple yourself. That a temple in its perhaps most basic definition is a place where heaven and earth meet. And that, as Paul says, we are meant to be the temples of our God. And so what does that mean? What, What are the experiences that we should be looking forward to working for, um, in order to become a temple ourselves. Yeah, that's great. Thank you for that explanation. That's really helpful. Um, so this particular course that you've put out there has a fee associated with it. Um, can you talk a little about that fee and why you decided to put a a fee together on it? That'll be a question. Some people have. Yes. And thank you for asking. And thank you for the other people that have asked us. (laughs) Um, We really appreciate when, if you have a concern, you're willing to reach out to us. So it does have a fee. It's $19.95. We decided to add that after our own wrestle. I'm going to ask his dad to come because he's being so loud. Um, But we decided to add a fee. Uh, after our own wrestle with the Lord and really trying to counsel with him about what he wanted us to do. And that might sound odd to people. I know that in the church, it's kind of cultural that gospel learning should be free as much as possible. And we're very blessed that we have an organization that can support that a lot of the time. Um, For us and for myself, I'll speak for myself and Corey can add um, his thoughts, uh, it really helped me to understand a truer definition of what priestcraft is. Because that's always the thing that we say, right? That if there's a charge associated with something gospel related, 
um, red flags go up and people say, well, this, this could be priestcraft. So in second Nephi chapter 26, verse 28, it says, he commanded that there shall be no priestcrafts for behold, priestcrafts are that men preach and set themselves up for a light unto the world that they may get gain and praise of the world, but they seek not the welfare of Zion. Thank you. Um, so that was really important for me to understand that a priestcraft is not just having money associated with something gospel related. It has to do with the intent of the people that are presenting it. Are they doing it for the welfare of Zion or are they doing it for themselves? And Corey and I, I, I mean, no one has to believe us when we say this because we're just testifying of ourselves right now. Um, but I can say that we have no interest in being a light to anyone. We only want to radiate the light of Christ. Uh, this was something we felt impressed to do. We felt impressed that having a price on it would help people value it for themselves. Sometimes if something is free, we don't pay attention to it. We don't value it because it doesn't require sacrifice. And sacrifice is a true principle, right? It is It is patterned all over the life of Christ, all over humanity. That sacrifice is how things become valued. Um, and so we did decide to do that. Now, all that being said, we've already given away hundreds of subscriptions to this class. And all you have to do is email me and I will give you free access to the class. So I don't want, and, and we put this on the homepage too. If you go to the class, um, we'll put the, we'll put the link in the chat. It's lddisciplesacademy.thinkific, think, I-F-I-C.com. If you go to the class, you can find it. It's at the bottom of the homepage that if cost is a problem, reach out to us and we'll give it to you for free. We don't want to hinder anyone. Um, the money doesn't matter. Literally, the money sits in account. We don't do anything with it. We're registering as a nonprofit. It does help cover our expenses because we do have operating expenses with the podcast. Um, it does go to things like our Secret Savior Service Project if the Lord inspires us to do that. But honestly, the way that we view it is that this is a completely consecrated account. The Lord is the one who dictates how those funds are, are spent. And again, you don't have to believe me. <laughs> you don't have to believe me on this. Um, so if you have any concerns, please feel free to reach out and we'll give it to you for free. We're, we're not afraid to do that. But we did feel like to help other people value the course, it was important for us to have that fee associated with it. So I'll, I'll just share a, a related thought on this. So I, living in uh, North Utah County, uh, 23 years ago when we moved here to this area, I loved soccer and wanted to play soccer. And there were no adult leagues. And so after a few years, I decided to start an adult soccer league. And I put up a website and I had a couple of cities um, put an announcement in their monthly newsletter to residents and just said, hey, go to Oak's website and sign up for his soccer league if you want. It's totally free. And so I had, I want to say about 160 people that first year that signed up. I organized teams and I was all excited to play soccer and it was free. And, you know, of the people that showed up, it was maybe 50%, you know, would show up. And so the games were all a little bit short. And so the next year I thought, okay, I've got to charge something to get a little bit more commitment out of people. And so I would charge like 12 bucks and give a t-shirt, you know, I'd print out a custom t-shirt for people. And the participation went up, the league increased and grew. And, and so I've been doing that ever since. But um, yeah, like you said, sometimes you have to put a little bit of skin in the game because you get something for free and you don't value it, or sometimes you just set it aside because you're like, oh, I'll, I'll get to that. But if you say, oh, I actually spent 20 bucks on this, which is not very expensive, um, then you do have a little bit more commitment. And I like your course that I'm about 25% of the way through it. And um, just in lesson two, um, last module. And the the thing I like is you, you do send out reminders because I... I am fairly busy. And so like every week or so I get another email like, Hey, don't forget about this course. I'm like, Oh yeah, let me go hit one more <laughs> module. And so 
I'm slowly going through it, but I love that there's little reminders to help me progress through it. So that's very helpful. Yeah, thank you. We really love the platform that we were able to build it on. I think it's really well organized. It was intuitive for us. We're not, I'm not very technological. <laughs> Neither was Corey. So the fact that we were able to put it in this format says a lot about um, just uh, how it's built. So hopefully other people enjoy that as well. Yeah. So let me, at this point, I'll open it up for other people to ask questions. If you have a question, um, you've got two experts on here, not me. So uh, Corey and Megan would be happy to answer your questions, especially if it relates to the course or to something, uh, you know, maybe you've got a question about the temple that they can answer. And so just click the Q&A button at the bottom of your Zoom window, and that will uh, come to me and I'll ask them the question. So Anne has a question. She's the first one on here. She said, I was taught not to talk about what happens in the temple. And then she asks, is the church leadership supporting what you are doing? If you'd like to address that. Um, yes, let me take a stab at it. So um, first of all, I think it's helpful that I mean, I'm nobody in the church. Megan's nobody in the church. So nobody has to listen to us, right? Um, when I when I first came out with my book, I had um I was working in the Mount Timonogos Temple at the time. One of the members of our temple presidency had been uh, part of the church's correlation committee. He'd been on the committee and he'd worked in CES all of his life and he was kind of a an expert on everything. And I I actually took the manuscript to him and I said, hey, would you look at this before I publish it and just see if there's any, you know, give me any feedback you have. He came back and he he had a question or two, um, but he really, really liked it and, and encouraged me to support it. I have several friends who are general authorities who have read and have expressed their appreciation for what I've done. Um, I've had several temple presidents contact me and say, hey, this has been wonderful. This is so needed. We're actually using this to train our workers. We're using this in our instruction meetings, et cetera. So um, I don't know how far whatever I've done has gone. And, and um, obviously this class is fairly new, but it's built upon the same things. I don't know how far up the chain that has ever gone, but I have not ever heard anything except... Um, uh, support and good work. And this is super helpful. As far as the other part of that question, it's a really, really good question. I was taught not to talk about what happens in the temple. Well, I was taught that in my generation too. <laughs> I think that was, but I, I think that's begun to change. If you look at the last few years, I mean, um, the church has produced a number of videos and they've discussed the sake, the ceremonial clothing and, and things like that. If you really pay attention in the endowment, there are only a cup. There's only, you know, we covenant not to disclose name signs and tokens and that's it. The rest of it is in the scriptures. I mean, the, the almost the whole ceremony and dialogue and everything is, is right there in the scriptures. And so I think this, I don't know where this came from. Obviously, we want to keep it sacred. And obviously, we want to treat sacred things with great respect, and we should. But I think we've done ourselves in the past a great disservice by not discussing. I mean, I think it'd be wonderful to walk into a gospel doctrine class someday and say, hey, let's have a discussion today on the law of the gospel. What does that mean? You know, because we never talk about that. And that's and that's very that's a very uh, I mean it's something we've all covenanted to do and yet we never even talk about it we don't even know what it means and um, so I think it is I, I think that is changing I'm really happy to see that changing um, and I also think it's important because honestly you know with with Google and with the internet you know everything's out there anyway so you know. Um, and I, and I think it's much better if we can present this, especially with kids. I find the, the youth, okay, when I was a bishopric at BYU and we're in a young single adult ward, they'd all been online. They already knew. I mean, they, they're they Googling all this stuff. Well, let's not let Google teach them about it. Let's teach our kids 
about their temple experience. Let's uh, talk to one another. Yes, let's not let's not maybe discuss things that we've covenanted not to discuss, but let's recognize there's a whole bunch of it that's in the scripture, and there's a whole bunch that we can talk about and that we should probably talk about. Yeah, better it seems better to uh, allow uh, faithful sources to uh, influence people instead of finding what people mockers would you know uh, yeah. publish and say. No, I don't think the Lord intended anybody to get their endowment on Google. <laughs> There's a reason it's in a <laughs> sacred place and sacred time. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, there's nobody else is is posting a question particularly about um, the course here, but uh, in terms of like just understanding, um, okay. So, so somebody did just ask a question. Let me just mention this for Barb and for everybody else. So the the location for the course is LD for latter day and then disciples academy dot thinkific and then there's a dot com after that is that right megan mm -hmm. yeah okay and you can I'll... also they can also find it on our website so that might be easier it's latterdaydisciples.com you'll click on education courses and it'll take you right to the page that might be that might be a little bit easier to find it that way that is probably easier latterdaydisciples.com education courses and uh you know, I guess just for being uh, on the, the webinar today, Megan is also offering a discount code. So even though it's an already inexpensive course, like you would buy a book, you know, from Deseret Book for 20 bucks, uh, but they're giving 50% off if you are uh, going to check this out. So it's scripture 23 for the code. So when you go to check out put in scripture 23. And I, like I said, I've already done about a quarter of the course and it's been, you know, already informative. I love the, the format, the images and things as you talk about them. So I'm, I'm looking forward to finishing this up and I know how much I've got, um, you know, in value from Corey's other materials. And so, um, but I, I need this stuff reinforced all the time for me because mm -hmm. I mean, it's, well, it's one, Honestly, it's like one of the reasons that I built scripture notes is because my memory is not anywhere near perfect. I don't have a photographic memory. Mm -hmm. So I've got to record things and I've got to see things over and over again. Yeah. If I can add to that, actually, I, I love that you brought up the visual aspect of it. And throughout the class, uh, we were given permission from a number of artists to use their artwork throughout the class. And so just from that perspective, I think the class is so beautiful because we have all of these images of Christ. We have all of these, we have, we have really beautiful images of Heavenly Mother and Heavenly Father throughout the class as we're talking about these sacred topics. Um, so I love that you brought that up. And I wanted to add for the person that was wondering, like, does the church know about what you're doing? One of our artists took the class and he has an in with the church temple department or whatever. And so he did pass it on to them. I haven't heard anything yet. So I don't know. <laughs> I don't know if that's good or bad. Um, but in case you were wondering, I'm pretty sure someone somewhere in the church knows about it. Well, Corey, did you have a comment? And I'll, add, I'll just add, Oak, stick with the class because the further you get along, the, the early course, the early lessons kind of built or set some foundational material. To me, the more beautiful parts of the course come um, a little further in. So you're getting to the good stuff. I'm sure. I, you know, so I totally get that uh, everybody has to have some prep. You know, you, you can't take the the meat without the milk. And yeah, so there's some basic stuff, but even in this, uh, there's things that like uh, the, the most recent thing I was watching was your explanation of the temple or the tabernacle of Moses. And there were a couple of things you mentioned there that I was like, Oh, I didn't realize this connection. And I don't remember exactly what it was, but, um, you know, it's, it's all good. And, and so I, if, if it's stuff that is, familiar to me, I just put it on higher speed, you know? So I, I love that too. If, if like, uh, some of you are 
an audible listener or you listen to stuff at a, a faster speed. Um, I do that all the time. And so there's a speed control on your course and that's, that's helpful for the basic stuff. And then, you know, I'll slow it back down when it gets to the uh, meteor topics, I guess. So I am, uh, I think that's, that's uh, pretty much where we'll end. And I just really appreciate you both being on today. Um, it's been super helpful, and I hope that a lot of people will sign up and take this course and, uh, you know, do some more homework on the symbolism and things of the temple, because uh, the more you learn, the more the experience can enrich your um, your life. And so if you if we just go through life blind and like Corey said, you know, expecting like, well, I'll just I'll get all that in the next life. I think we miss out on opportunities in this life to to have greater spiritual experiences and greater enrichment to see the world through temple eyes and uh, understand the, the path that we're on that leads back to the tree of life. So with that, I don't know if either of you have a parting comment uh, about uh, your the temple or something, but uh, I'll I'll leave last words to you. Well, I'll I'll share my testimony really quick of the temple. Um, I was blessed to live, uh, you know, five minutes from a temple for a long time. And beginning in 2002, uh, I started um, attending the temple weekly. It just I found it was just easiest to set aside a, a block of time and and once a week and go. And so for 14 years, I attended weekly. And I can testify that um, just that experience alone, being um, there in that environment every week, you know, having a chance to step out of this world that we live in and step into a, a different culture, a different realm that's, that's more closely aligned with heaven, um, and being able to take some time and ponder and really wonder thinking about where I'm at and then going out in the world and trying to live those covenants and then coming back each week and kind of reviewing that, that process, um, maybe more than any other really changed me as a person. It blessed my marriage and my family made me a much better person, helped me draw a lot closer to my savior. Um, it helped me ironically through some of the most difficult years of my life. And also gave some of the most beautiful spiritual experiences that I've had. So I just I know you're you're if if you're on this webinar you're probably um, already attending and already going. But just want to encourage, um, along with the course, spend time in the temple. And uh, you know Megan did such a wonderful job in organizing this and breaking it up into little pieces or little segments so that it's easy to digest and it gives you some time to think. But uh, if you'll attend the temple and as you're going through the course, and if you'll make temple worship a regular part of your life, I think it'll bless you in, in maybe unexpected ways in your family. Yeah. I love what you said, Oak, about developing temple eyes. I think that's so beautiful. And I think that we are meant to become temple people, all of us. And when I, when I received my endowment, when I participated for the first time in the temple, I remember going through the veil um, and hugging my mom in the celestial room. And I was like, okay, that's it. Like we did it. We're good. That's how it all happened. And now I'm here and I did all the things and, and we're good. And the Lord has been so gracious to show me how very wrong I was and that the temple is a template it teaches us a pattern, a pattern that is meant to be lived. It's meant to be embodied and it's meant to be experienced outside the walls of the temple. So as Corey was saying, go to the temple, go often, learn the pattern, and then leave the temple and learn how to live the temple, learn how to see with temple eyes and be a temple person, because those are the people uh, in the scriptures <clears throat> Our podcast, we talk a lot about the second coming of the Lord. And in the scriptures, it says that the Lord will come speedily to his temple. And on one level, we can think of that as a physical building. And I think on a much more true level, we should think of that as his people.
that we are meant to be the temple to whom the Lord is speedily going to return. And this class, I hope to share as a sacrament of kinds of things, mostly that Corey learned. Corey did all the legwork. <laughs> um, and, and that we now, I've benefited from it. And now we hope to turn it around and pass these pieces to you. And we hope that as you partake of them uh, and learn to embody it for yourself, uh, we believe that this can be eternally life-changing. So that is the invitation that we have for you. Well, awesome. Thank you so much. And uh, let's see. So there's... Looks like, have, it looks like you have a couple of questions popped up if you want to. <laughs> there have, yeah. And one of these is long. That's that's maybe why it uh, came in. I'll just, I'll read this and um, we'll see where this goes. I, I haven't pre-read this. So a General Authority 70 recently was asked a question about a symbol in the temple by a temple ordinance worker in a Q&A session during a state conference. He said he would not answer that because it would deprive her of the experience of learning from the Lord what that symbol meant. He gave the example of parents telling their son during a temple open house that the altar symbolized sacrifice. Forever after, when their son went to the temple, that is what he believed that symbol meant. The 70 said it would limit our learning if we are given an answer from him or someone else about the meaning of the symbols as it did with that man. I felt concerned about his answer because I was working through your course and then felt maybe I shouldn't be. He was an amazingly inspired speaker during the state conference. When I was working through your course before that, I had felt it was very educational and enlightening and encouraging me that I would be able to learn more than before. So... Uh, what would you say to that? Um, let me take a stab at it really quick. So I, <laughs> I, I can understand his answer and his concern. Um, I have heard, sometimes I have heard ordinance workers or someone giving an explanation that I felt like was completely wrong. More often than not, I've heard an answer along these lines. Oh, we don't talk about that, or we don't ask about that, or you don't. I, I remember at one point in time, I had a question, and it was a very sincere question um, as I was, you know, going through this. Um, and I went in to the temple president and asked him, and I've known, I, I worked as an ordinance worker for, for 10 years under three different presidents and got to know each of them and saw kind of, and they're all good men and they're doing a, a, a difficult job and they're doing a wonderful job of it. But um, I, I, I remember as a young man going in with a specific question and asking the temple president a, a very sincere and honest question about a part of the endowment. And the answer he gave me was, um, was not really satisfying what he did he sat down and he said you know he said none of the prophets from joseph smith down to i think it was president hinckley was the was at the time none of them have ever given any explanation of the endowment i find that very significant don't you that was his answer to me and his question to me that was his statement and it, and his question. And I said, well, okay, yeah, I guess so. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> and I left his office like, you're not going to get an answer. Um, since then, I, you know, in the years that, that followed that, I found, number one, his statement was not correct, that there are a number of them that have made a, a great number of statements about the temple. So what he told me was wrong. And number two... I, this is just my own personal belief. I don't think he knew the answer to the question. And I and I really wish he would have just said, you know, that's a great question. I don't know. I haven't thought about it or whatever it is. Um, sometimes, and, and I and and yes, there is some some wisdom in this '70s answer that, um, you know, I don't want to just limit your understanding. But at the same time, 
if we if 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 we have the understanding that you, these symbols can mean multiple things, and here's one possible interpretation, then it can be very beneficial. I remember one day overhearing um, an ordinance worker was talking about um, the order of prayer, and he made a simple comment that um, that ceremony there is not just review. That was his comment. And he didn't say anything more than that. But that just that one little statement caused me to really stop and ponder because I had always assumed up to that point, I had I had completely assumed that the order of prayer, that that, that, that portion of the ceremony was that, that what we do there was simply a review. And, and so his statement really kind of stuck with me because, wait a minute, this isn't just review, then then what is it? Why, why are we doing that? And as I sat and pondered that, the Lord opened my eyes and I gained some really beautiful insight into how he views that prayer and into the purpose of that prayer. And this whole thing unfolded to me and it never would have happened without that comment because I wouldn't have had the question. If you go look at the scriptures, you know, the Doctrine and Covenants is a great example. Almost every revelation in the Doctrine and Covenants comes to Joseph Smith after he goes to the Lord with a question. Um, there's a pattern there, and it, and it's a pattern for us that we, you know, we need to go to the Lord. We need to be asking questions so that we can get answers, and we can learn a tremendous amount from each other. And and I think, and and again, I'm not criticizing. I'm not judging this general authority. I wasn't there. But I really disagree with, and I think we do a tremendous disservice when we say, "Oh, we shouldn't talk about that. I'm not going to answer you. No, you know, none of the prophets have said anything about that." Well, okay, you know, just go let the Lord teach you. Well, we we all need to learn math, basic math, and then algebra, and then geometry, and trigonometry, and everything else before we get to calculus. And fortunately, we had some teachers that taught us basic math and didn't just say, oh, go figure it out for yourself. You know, so I really find this kind of appalling. Um, one, one th well, one thought that comes to me is, how does the Lord teach us? Well, sometimes it's by an impression of the Spirit, and sometimes it's by somebody telling us something. Exactly. I, I don't know how many times I've had a question or something, and, uh, you know, or, or even on my mission, how many times... I studied something literally that morning, went out, was talking to someone who asked me the question I had just studied and answered them. And I was like, this is uncanny how often this happens. And so like having access to thoughts that inspire us or that like even the scriptures themselves, like you mentioned earlier, Corey, how much of the content of the endowment is in the scriptures. So it's like, there's a ton of the the content there and having somebody help open it up like Philip did for the uh, eunuch, you know, reading Isaiah. Um, I don't, I don't see that there's a problem with that to, to gain insight because it doesn't limit what we, uh, you know, can understand. It's just like saying, Oh, there's an insight here that I can now attach to and say, how does that fit in the framework? But I'm still building the walls and the, uh, you know, putting putting the windows and doors in and, you know, putting the the temple together. So I, I don't know. That would be, I don't I don't have a problem with uh, you know learning things and certainly general authorities have have said a lot of stuff about the temple, maybe not too many specifics about certain symbols, but um, I don't know. That that'd be my thoughts. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. I think one of the things the Lord has been teaching me lately is that literally nothing is coincidence, like literally nothing. We say that we don't believe in coincidence, but we kind of do. <laughs> when you start going around your life and thinking every single thing that comes up for me today is because the Lord is putting it in my path. That is a totally different way of looking at things. And so if the Lord has put this class in your path, Maybe there's something to that. I'm not going to testify to that. I think that's an opportunity to commune with the spirit and um, allow for the Lord to say whether or not this is something he wants you to learn from. 
Um, but yeah, I would say that more often than not, the Lord is going to use all sorts of means to teach us. Okay, here's one more question. Uh, somebody has started the first lesson and the module about temple symbolism was short. And then we were in, and they said we were invited to study those symbols. How do we do that? How can we find out and search temple symbols themselves? I was hoping you would discuss them and give me some direction to go from there. Did I miss something in the lesson? And uh, so I'll let you answer this, but I, I will say that um, Corey's books are a long explanation. Uh, I, I shouldn't say a long explanation loaded with explanations about some of this stuff. So why don't you share a little about the the course that you've put together online and how it ties into this? Well, I, I think this is a great question, uh, Alicia or whoever, um, however, I'm sorry if I'm not saying your name correctly, but um, it's a great question. I think if you'll be patient and continue on with the class, um, you'll we'll discuss a lot of these of the temple symbols in much greater detail as you progress mm -hmm. through the course. It, it wasn't all meant to be dumped into one concise spot in that particular lesson. Um, I think there's also some, uh, I think Megan put together a list of additional resources. So if there's a topic or if there's a subject in the class that you want to study in more depth, then in most cases we have uh, books and resources and other things that we can point you towards. For example, on the on symbolism specifically, um, Alonzo Ga Gaskill, uh, was a BYU professor, he wrote a book called The Lost Language of Symbolism. Um, I was looking, I have a copy of it on my bookshelf. It's a great resource. It's a little bit of an uh, encyclopedic type thing, but it's a good resource for understanding symbols of numbers and colors and different things like that. Um, the the class, we're going to really talk more specifically about temple symbols, but, uh, you know, as, as stick with it as you go through the class. I think uh, a lot of that will be answered and will kind of unfold yeah. in greater detail. Yeah, I was going to add, so 175 Temple Symbols and Their Meanings by Donald Perry, I found was really insightful. Again, all of this with the caveat that we know that symbols work on multiple levels, that there's not just going to be one single interpretation. Um, but that that's a book I would recommend. In terms of just kind of taking a more organic approach to studying symbols in themselves, what I would kind of recommend is when you think about the temple or when you review the temple ceremonies in your head, looking for things like sacred geometry, noting numbers that are there, noting colors that are included. If you look in the scriptures and study the ancient tabernacle, I think there's a lot that you can pull from that too that are important symbols when you think about the menorah the Ark of the Covenant and the things that it contained, et cetera. And then you can go to scripture notes and you can do an intertextual search for those keywords. So if you, for example, if you searched for the word cherubim or scarlet, um, you're going to get a number of scriptures that pop up for you. And as you study those scriptures intertextually, they're going to give you information about what those symbols mean about how they relate to God, about what they teach us, about Jesus Christ, and about our own process of, of progression, of, of, um, of ascension and becoming perfect in Christ. So that's actually something that I do pretty regularly when I, when I um, prepare podcasts is I love scripture notes for studying intertextually. And Oak did not tell me how to answer this question, but <laughs> I was just going to plug, <laughs> plug his platform anyway, because it really is so helpful as we've talked about the scriptures are the best narrative and understanding the temple. So go to the scriptures, use this application and see what the scriptures have to say about some of the things that you note in our temple ceremonies. Awesome. Awesome answer, Megan. <laughs> so, no, I, I appreciate that. And I, I have one question uh, as I was going through and you do talk about there's, you know, it'll be in our resource section. Where is the resource mm -hmm. section? I, I kind of tried to flip through it quickly um, one time, but I didn't see like the resource section. Yeah. It's not so much a section as it is just a part of the course here. I'm trying to see if I can actually pull it up really quick. Um, but if you go, 
to the class itself in the first section, the introductory sh- section of the class, um, there is, there should be a tab that says additional resources. <clears throat> okay. And so if you go to that additional resources, you'll find a document. We literally have like 10 pages of of not just not just books, but we have books, we have articles, we have podcasts. Uh, like we, we seriously have, we have all of the art, all of the art in the class and who the artist is and where you can find all the art is all listed on that additional resource page. So there, there's a lot there for um, for studying beyond the scope of this class. Again, this this class is only six hours. That sounds like a lot, but when it comes to the pattern of eternal progression, it's really nothing. So um, if you're looking for more, that's a great place to start. Cool. Yeah, I I see that now. I had not clicked back into that uh, after I got past that point. So (laughs) I was was anticipating it would be at the end, not the beginning, but that's that's great. All right. Well, thank you both again. I really appreciate your uh, time today and going through this. And I, I think it's so helpful to uh, expand our understanding of the temple. And, and so with that, we will visit again another time. Thank you, Oak. Thanks, Corey. Thanks, Megan. Opportunity.